Amen. Do please take a seat. I think that's a wonderful little verse. Weak is the effort of my heart and cold my warmest thought. It's such a, a stark kind of reality check about our own spiritual walk so much of the time. That sounds like my life. And then the hope in the next line is not, and so I'll work twice as hard, or I'll whip myself up into a frenzy, but one day I'll see Jesus. And when I see him, I will be like him, for I will see him as he is. When I see you as you are, I'll praise you as I ought. We are headed towards a future where there is no sin and there is no awkward self-consciousness. We will just enjoy the beauty and the glory of God together for all eternity. This evening we're in the book of 1 Kings and chapter 17. If you have a Bible, uh, please do be turning to that chapter. As you know, we've just this morning concluded a series in the book of James and our our standard pattern uh, has been to find in the evening a passage that relates to what we saw uh, this morning. So ideally we're looking at similar kind of ideas in both the morning and the evening service. Uh, Well, this evening's passage uh, is an obvious one because James directly referenced it. 1 Kings chapter 17 And we'll read from verse 1 to 16. Now Elijah, the Tishbite, from Tishbe in Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah. Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the Kerith Ravine. East of the Jordan, you will drink from the brook, and I have instructed the ravens to supply you with food there. So he did what the Lord had told him. He went to the Kerith Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. Sometime later, the brook dried up because there had been no rain in the land. The word of the Lord came to him, go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I have instructed a widow there to supply you with food. So he went to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make myself a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said. But first, make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and for her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our Lord endures forever. Father in heaven, we are grateful to have this time together this evening and to sit under the authority of your word. And we pray that you'd help me as I speak, help me to be clear and biblical and helpful. And help us all, we pray, to worship you by giving you, to the best of our ability, the full attention of our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, as you know, we finished up our series in the book of James, looking at James chapter 5, verses 13 to 20. And as you know, it had everything to do with the the place and the importance and the power of prayer. Now, a couple of verses that we deliberately skipped over this morning, because it gave us the opportunity to expand on them this evening, are these verses right in the middle of this morning's passage. So we read, Elijah was a human being, even as we are. 
He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Now, at the risk of being overly simplistic, this morning's passage roughly divided up into two halves. So we were thinking about physical illness in the first half, the person on their sickbed, and spiritual illness on the second half. And especially we were thinking about how we, as God's people, ought to respond to others in that state, especially but not exclusively how elders of the church, shepherds of the flock, uh, should respond to those who are physically ill and those who are spiritually ill. So the person on their deathbed physically ill ought to be supplied with prayer and any practical help that they need, and in the same way, the person wandering from the faith is spiritually ill and ought to be supplied with prayer and any practical help that you can give to bring them back. And in doing so, uh, you might just save their life, James says. And then the bridge between these two stories was this little sentence about Elijah and the power of prayer. I think James picks the story of Elijah deliberately because it draws on both of those themes, uh, physical well-being and spiritual well-being. It does so wonderfully. And so in God's kindness, we've got some time together this evening where we can explore that entire story and, Lord willing, uh, reinforce some of those ideas that we were thinking about. So that's why we're in 1 Kings chapter 17 this evening. And let's begin at verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Now, there is an awful lot packed into that first verse. Firstly, Elijah. Now, I'm aware that um, most of you will know a good deal about Elijah, uh, not least from your own study of Scripture and from your own time in church, uh, but also because a few years ago, you might remember, uh, Stuart took you on a tour through the life of Elijah in the Elijah Diaries. And so you will know much about his life already. Uh, But just so that we're on the same page, Elijah is one of the major characters in the Old Testament, and this is the very first time we meet him. This is how we are introduced to him. We're not told about his family, and we're not told about his childhood, and we're not told about any sort of direct call from God upon his life. It is all just a mystery to us. (laughs) We know next to nothing about him. Now, we've been studying 1 Samuel recently. Compare that with what you know about Um, King Saul, when he's appointed. We are told where he comes from. We are told about the sort of financial status of his family. You are told that he is tall. You're told about his physical appearance, his handsomeness. You're told about his day-to-day business, looking after his father's animals. Early on in his story, you are told all these details about him. But this man, Elijah, it kind of bursts on the scene out of nowhere, and we're told next to nothing about him. We don't even really know where he comes from. We're told Tishbe in Gilead. Uh, Just for your own interest, there is a huge debate about where exactly that place is because there are almost no other references to it. In other words, he's not a famous man. He doesn't have an important background. He doesn't have a big reputation. He's basically unknown. And he doesn't seem to want you to know much about him. (laughs) He doesn't share that information. But he does want you to know about God. The one thing we do know about him is his name, Elijah. The one thing we've been told and can be certain of is his name. And like many Hebrew names, it is rich with meaning. So there are two halves to this man's name. Eli, think of Jesus on the cross saying Eloi, Eloi, means my God, my God. So Eli means God. And Jah, the second half, is short for Yahweh. So Yahweh is God. That is his name. And that is also his proclamation, right? And what an interesting name for him to have at such a time as this. Going into the palace of King Ahab, squaring off against the forces of darkness in a society that worships all sorts of false idols, Elijah comes in declaring, Yahweh is God and God alone. And he will uphold that truth throughout the passage. In fact, we're told even more than that in the very first verse. He goes to Ahab, and we'll find out a little bit more about him in just a moment. And he says this, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, 
Okay, so there is one God, Yahweh is God. He is the God of Israel, so he's got a special affection, special relationship with Israel, though he is the one true God of all the world. And he lives as he lives. He's the living God, Elijah says. And then, whom I serve. So already, (laughs) this wonderfully rich picture of Elijah's life and the God that he serves. There is one true God, his name is Yahweh. He loves his people, Israel. I love him, I serve him, and there is no other God beside him. And now, I declare to you, in God's name, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at my word. There is an awful lot packed into just that first verse, isn't there? Now, one of the things that I love about God's word is how scripture sheds light on itself from other vantage points. So here's what I mean. In the narrative, the first thing we are told is that Elijah marches up to King Ahab. But James gives us more information than just that. James tells us what's been going on before that. James tells us, no, Elijah prayed earnestly for this. Before making this proclamation, He spent great time in prayer. Elijah prayed earnestly that it would not rain. In other words, this massive confrontation with him and the king, this is not where the story starts. The story starts with prayer, private and personal prayer for Elijah. James says, Elijah was just a man, just a human being, even as we are, with all kinds of weaknesses and blind spots. An ordinary guy, you might say. But he served an extraordinary God. And he prayed to this God earnestly. And God miraculously answered his prayer. Now then, what would provoke Elijah to pray for this specific thing? That the rain would stop for three and a half years. Well, this confrontation between Elijah, the man of God, and King Ahab has an important history. Turn back just one page to chapter 16 and verse 29. We read, in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Now listen to this. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. And those who came before him were not much cop either. (laughs) They were fairly awful, fairly godless kings for the most part. But this guy, Ahab, the new king on the block, he is the worst of the lot. We read, he not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, a daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he had built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. So this king then is is just utterly immoral. And the offense on top of all the others that he's committed, that previous kings had done as well, the particular offense that arouses the anger of God is Baal worship. Introducing the worship of a false god, even building a temple to this false god in Samaria, it seems, on the advice of his new wife, Jezebel. Now, here is why Elijah um, prays for this and then proclaims there will be no more rain in the land. Baal was considered to be the fertility god. And so, um, the followers of Baal believed that it was by his hand that their crops grew and their soil was made fertile. You see how these things are connected then? Elijah, with all the confidence of a man who really does believe in the power of prayer, marches up to the palace and speaks to this godless king over God's own people and says, there will be no more rain until I say so by the power of God and there is nothing your Baal can do about it. (laughs) He can't stop this wonderful God. So Elijah then is exposing for Ahab, but for all people to see, who is really the one who has provided all these wonderful blessings that they live by? Who has really been giving this wonderful gift of rain? Who's bestowed all these blessings upon them? It has been God. It has been Yahweh all the way through. Now, we might think it is strange that Ahab is 
attributing all these blessings to a false god, but it's worth pointing out that is what everybody does (laughs) unless they believe in the one true God. Unless they are a Christian, that is what everybody does about everything all the time. If you believe in karma, for example, you are attributing the blessings of God to your own previous good behavior. It was you who earned those things, not God who gave them to you. The person who believes there is no God, uh, that there is just randomness and chance, attributes all of God's blessings to just nothingness, chance, an accident. Perhaps most people attribute the blessings they enjoy to the hard work they put in. They feel like they've earned these things uh, without making any room in their mind for the fact that they did not put themselves in the position to take the opportunity that gave them the blessing in the first place. Uh, They didn't give themselves the inclination to work hard. They didn't give themselves the willpower or the skill or the strength or the brain power or the potential or the parents or the upbringing. They didn't choose to be born into this part of the world. They didn't choose to be born in this century with all the advantages and opportunities open to them. They can take credit for next to nothing. And yet they look around at the successes of their life and say, This was all brought about by me and my hard work. There's a famous chapter in the book of Deuteronomy in in chapter 8 that says, You may say to yourself, My power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. So wealth is a a gift from God, but so is the ability to work hard. It all comes from him. It is all a gift from God's gracious hand. And so Elijah then, in this passage, is really just clarifying for King Ahab. None of this comes from Baal. All of this comes from God. Don't be deceived. These are blessings from his hand. And if he wants to, he can close that hand whenever he chooses. He can turn off that tap whenever he decides to. He can make sure that it will not rain and there is nothing Baal can do about it. Render your God absolutely useless because of it. Now the very next verse, after this kind of bold proclamation before the king, Elijah, uh, God speaks to Elijah and he sends him off into hiding, we read. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, leave here, turn eastward and hide in the Kerith ravine east of the Jordan. You will drink from the brook and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. Now, why is that? What a strange turn of events from something that looks so triumphant to suddenly look so kind of timid almost. (laughs) Well, two reasons, two obvious reasons at least. Firstly, because Elijah is in some degree of danger now. Uh, You'll know that there is an awful lot of retribution heading his way, not just from Ahab, but from Ahab's evil wife, Jezebel, as well. So he's being protected uh, for his own safety, protected from others, But there's also, perhaps, a sense in which he's being protected from himself. Several times in the Bible, we see stories of people who come out of nowhere and are given some kind of position or prominence, and they almost always become proud because of it. Perhaps even uh, Joseph, when he gets his first glimpse at glory, do you remember? Perhaps there's something proud in the way he has to share that news with his brothers who are bound to be upset by it. Uh, The sun, moon, and stars all bowing down before me. Everyone's going to be bowing down before me. There's perhaps an element of pride in that. Uh, David, the humble little shepherd boy, becomes the king of the nation. And you see how the pride uh, sneaks into his life as well. We thought about this morning the the fact that Paul was given this uh, thorn in the flesh deliberately so that he might stay humble, so that he might be reminded of his weakness. It's a good thing for him. And so Elijah, having just confronted the most powerful man in the nation, having just spoken words that have shut off the rain and will continue to do so for the next three and a half years, he is not allowed to kind of linger on the stage. (laughs) He's not allowed to stay in the spotlight, not allowed to soak up the applause of the audience. He is sent off into hiding by himself. He's brought low. So he's being protected externally and perhaps internally as well, protected from other people's power and maybe from his own pride as well. He goes off to the Kerith Ravine. Now, it simply would not do for him to go off into hiding, and then every day when he gets hungry, wander to the nearest bakery and pick up some food for himself. He's supposed to be in hiding. 
And so God arranges this miraculous home delivery service. It's a wonderful way to undergird the faith of Elijah. Elijah, do you believe God controls everything? Everything. Not just the big things, but even the small things as well. Do you believe that God controls not just the rain, but the ravens? (laughs) Do you believe that if God says it, it will be done? That he can put bread in your hand through the beak of an unclean bird? Do you believe it? Because that is exactly what happens. Elijah is forced to live by faith, receiving each day his daily bread. Now, there's an interesting kind of lesson within a lesson here. You remember back in Leviticus 11, when the birds were being categorized, clean and unclean. God declared that the raven is an unclean bird. Now, why choose this unclean bird to bring about this wonderful miracle? He could pick any bird under the sun, couldn't he? He is God. Well, yeah, he could, but how helpful for Elijah to be reminded that God can bring unexpected outcomes through unclean creatures. Just as the ravens are still but a tool in the hand of the Almighty God, so Ahab, with all his rebellion and his resistance, is still nothing more than a tool in God's hand. He will be used even for good and glorious purposes, and there is nothing our God cannot do. Now, I reckon... If I were Elijah, I would be feeling um, a little frustrated, perhaps, at being sent off into hiding, uh, frustrated by the raven situation. It wouldn't take long for these daily deliveries to uh, lose their charm a little bit. I can imagine thinking, I could be doing so much more for the kingdom. I could be saying so much more to the people of God. I could be confronting King Ahab. Couldn't I be sharing the word of God with him? Couldn't I be ministering to someone in some way? What is God doing here? Isn't he wasting time keeping me off in the sidelines like this? Now, Elijah probably wouldn't think like that, but perhaps I would, and perhaps you would be tempted to as well. And so it's worth saying that God knows exactly what he's doing, not just with provision, but also with his people. He is using his people in the way that will bring glory to the sheep as he becomes a shepherd. David is developing his own courage, isn't he? We read about him fighting off bears and lions. Well, he's going to need that courage as the leader of the nation facing off against much more formidable foe. And Elijah here is learning to trust God every day, every day. Not just with the big things, but with the small things as well. Not just in the massive moments of life, but also in just the receiving of daily bread to keep him going. Nothing is wasted. Again, for us, perhaps we long for days of more excitement. Perhaps we long for bigger things in our own day, and that's good and well. But nevertheless, God would tell us that we should be faithful even in the small days, as in Learn the lessons that he's teaching you now because you might need these lessons in five or 10 or 20 years time. Who knows what God might choose to do through you or through us here at Moordown or through some secondary impact that we can't even perceive from this far off. Certainly our duty today is to live faithfully today. When we get to verse 7, we find out that the brook that had been providing water for Elijah had dried up because there was no rain in the land, we read. Now, it goes without saying, of course, that if God had decided to preserve this brook and continue to use it as a supernatural means of sustenance for Elijah, well, of course, he could have done that. He could have done that, but he chooses not to. Often we want God to save us from hardship, (laughs) And often he chooses to save us in hardship instead. As we saw this morning, some Christians seem to think that they ought to expect a nice, comfortable, easy, straightforward, simple life with no sickness and no suffering at all. But the Bible certainly never makes that promise. God certainly could save us from hardships, but often he saves us in hardships. Almost always, suffering is like a refiner's fire. It purifies our faith. It helps us to love God more through it. It's almost always for our good to go through hard and difficult times because we come out on the other side with a greater awareness of God. So Elijah even is not spared the consequences of this drought. 
He might have hoped to have been, but he's not. The brook dries up and suddenly he has nothing left either. And then the word of God goes to him and says, verse 9, Go at once to Zarephath in the region of Sidon and stay there. I've directed a widow there to supply you with food. Now that particular place, Zarephath, is the home of Jezebel, of all people. Jezebel, who introduced Ahab to Baal worship in the first place, and then all Israel through him. So he's being taken, if you like, into the heart of enemy territory. And so what is God showing Elijah here? Well, I can preserve you. I can protect you, not just here where things are comfortable and you're getting water from the brook and bread from the birds. I can protect you and provide for you even in the heart of enemy territory. I can use the most surprising, unusual circumstances to see to it that you have what you need. So he goes, verse 10, to Zarephath. When he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I may drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks so I can take home, uh, to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And so all the land is suffering the effects of this awful drought. The skies are not pouring forth rain. The land is not bringing forth crops. And despite this place being the home of Baal worship, apparently the god of fertility, even in Zarephath, there is nothing. This poor woman is on the receiving end of the godlessness of her king and her nation. And so she's gathering sticks, presumably to build a fire and cook a final meal where she then presumes she will starve to death. There is nothing left in the cupboards. There's nothing left in the land. Interestingly, back in verse 9, God said, I've prepared a widow to provide these things for you. But when Elijah actually turns up, it seems she knows nothing about God's preparation of her. And yet, even she is used in his plan, isn't she? It is a surprise for her to meet this man, Elijah. She's not the least bit prepared for it. And yet, she trusts what he says. And so God has shown his ability now to control the weather, to control creatures, and to control other people, such as this widow, so that all these things would work together for his amazing master plan. So they have this wonderful little uh, interaction where Elijah effectively says, look, I know you've got nothing, but trust me, God has sent me to you. Give me some bread, and God will see to it that you are looked after. Now, would you believe someone if they turned up <laughs> at your door, and you were in this situation? You had next to nothing in the house, and he says, yeah, give that last little bit to me first. This is an act of faith, isn't it? That she would believe the word of the Lord spoken through Elijah. God preserves her because of her faith. And so we read, The jar of flour will not be used up. The jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. She acted by faith, in other words, not by sight, not by pure logic. <laughs> she acted by faith, put into her heart by God, which is an interesting thing for this widow from a godless land to go ahead and do. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up, and the jug of oil did not run dry, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Again, in many ways, it seems like a small thing, doesn't it? This strange little interaction between Elijah and this widow and her son who is dependent upon her. It seems strange just to affect one woman and her life, and yet this is another little training ground for Elijah, isn't it? Another thing that he's learning and will be developed in him, a dependence upon God in any and all circumstances. He comes down out of the mountains, away from the brook, and he effectively teaches somebody else to trust in God as well. He's teaching this widow, let me tell you about Yahweh, who alone is God. This is what he said. This is his word. Will you trust him? And she says, yes. He's effectively become an evangelist here for the God that he knows and loves. And by the grace of God, they both live. 
Now, you know what happens in the next chapter, don't you? This almighty showdown between Elijah and the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. An incredible display of faith. An incredible moment of evangelistic power. But Elijah was prepared for that big moment by all these small ones that came before him. Prepared by incidents like these. Now, what I love is that prayer is such a natural, normal part of Elijah's life that we very rarely have our attention turned to his prayers in the text. And yet, as James told us this morning, both of these incidents, both the the turning off of the tap, as it were, and the restarting of it all, it was brought about by Elijah's prayer. And yet, nowhere in the text are we told that. It is literally, it goes without saying, (laughs) that all these things are undergirded by man's um, persistent prayer. Uh, Prayer then is not just an activity that must be done, it is an overflow of our hearts. It comes from a certain attitude, a certain trust in God. And so we don't see him in the text praying to God, and yet we're told afterwards, oh, he was praying all the way through this. None of these things would have been possible were it not for prayer. Which shows us, a prayer to those who trust in God, it ought to be about as natural as breathing. Elijah was just an ordinary man, James tells us. Utterly ordinary, and yet he prayed to an extraordinary God. And God, in his wisdom and in his kindness, answered those prayers in ways that he wouldn't dare have believed possible. Prayer, true prayer, is then an overflow of a faithful heart. And so this week, as we turn our attention to praying together and gathering as often as we can to do so, we ought to see prayer as the overflow of hearts that belong to God, of lives that are lived according to his will, of people who have faith in the one true God to provide, not necessarily all that we want, but certainly all that we need. And so let's pray together now and then regularly in the week ahead. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the wonderful gift of prayer that undergirds all these uh, wonderful works of God that we read about here. And we thank you that those who are in relationship with you can speak to you whenever they want. I thank you that you always answer prayer in accordance with what is wise and right and good and just. And so we ask in this coming week, as we gather to prayer, you'll give us not just the words to say, but the willingness to draw near to you, the God that we love. And may we grow in our knowledge and in our love of you and in our trust that you really do know what you are doing. And so we ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.